Hey everybody, welcome back to another uh, edition of Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. We're so glad you could be with us. We are. Uh, we think we have a very, very excellent podcast for you to listen to or, or view today. So uh, we always like to let you know that we're appreciative for, of all that you do to support our podcast and the, our effort to uh, bring people together with different ideas and different thoughts to learn how we can effectively dialogue and converse with one another and grow through that process and be a richer individual. Uh, so much of our society today is, is I have my side, you have your side, and all we do is argue and fight. We need to be better than that. So this is what Building Bridges is all about. So thanks for joining us. Hopefully you'll like, subscribe, or uh, do the notification bell, uh, bell uh, on the YouTube channel and uh, make a comment. That's always great. That helps us with YouTube. Uh, so wherever you're listening from or viewing, we uh, are so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, I'm going to throw it over to Jill, the other half of the Greg and Jill podcast. Uh, I'm always told the better half, but you know, so be it. You know, Jill, bring a greeting or say hi or do hi. something. Hi, <laughs> we are so thrilled to be with you today. We've been having some fascinating conversations with our guests this week. So we, or the, I should say this month, yeah. we are excited to share with you Richard Dutcher, a film producer and a new friend for yeah. us. Yeah, oh, thanks for having me. And, yeah. and, I don't know if this is a title you made up for yourself or if somebody gave it to you, but it's very genuine when we say to our audience that you are the father of Mormon, modern Mormon cinema, shall we say? Is that is that a legit title or? Yeah, that's what they, yeah, that's the, uh, one, one of the film critics gave me that title back in, gosh, I don't know, 2001 or two, and it, it stuck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you were the first into this genre, shall we say, of LDS distinctive films and and there was many that followed you, and you did a couple, and maybe you did more than that, three at least, yeah, right? Yeah, right. No, before, uh, I did a film called God's Army in 2000, and that was the first. Uh, before that, there had been, yeah, there we go. There it is. There's before a, that, there had been, you know, institutional films made by yeah, the church. Yeah. But um, it was, God's Army was the first film independently made. Yeah. So it, was, it wasn't made by the church, or it was just, I was LDS, and... And I just raised the money independently, did the film independently, distributed it independently in theaters, and uh, and it was a big success. And so it uh, it launched what became uh, the Mormon cinema movement, which at first I was very very proud of and um, very passionate about. And uh, yeah, last I heard, there there's been over like 200, oh, wow. 200 films um, made from that in that genre. Wow. And. Uh, it didn't go the way that I was hoping and the way that <laughs> well, I, you know, that I wanted. But um, well, I want to tell our audience that we actually met long ago. I, I was serving as a pastor and I was on a Sunstone panel, kind of a conference of intellectual Latter-day Saints uh, said to be a, a bit on the left hand side of things. You know, the the more uh, intellectually um, curious and, and, and kind of that that crowd. But we were on a panel together discussing Mormonism and media, and you, of course, were the director of God's Army uh, 1, and, and eventually you, there was a sequel, not by the same name, but, um, and I remember meeting you and just being fascinated by your approach, and that you took this very seriously, and what came out after you was a very different kind of filmmaking, where it was kind of silly and 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 more, uh, I don't know how you would define it, and I know you're not trying to be critical of, of other people's uh, projects, but it, it was different. Yours seemed to be more... Um, earnest and more more raw more real more authentic and these other ones were more silly is that fair to say or? yeah yeah that was that's very fair to say yeah. <laughs> uh, more farcical and uh well one of the things that happened was uh i was you know i always loved film just loved it and, yes uh, and so people have often asked me if like did you intend to create this thing called mormon cinema and i was like oh absolutely that was the <laughs> genesis it was like it wasn't just god's army but I was on fire. I was just like, you know, at the time, uh, I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. And, and before that, I hadn't made, uh, I'd made like a, um, a romantic comedy that uh, got picked up by HBO. And that's kind of where I learned, really learned how to make a film was by making a film independently. But um, I had kind of reached this point in my very early career where I felt like it was kind of impossible to be a filmmaker and a a man of God. And it was a real struggle for me, you know, all the way, you know, it was, it was, it had always been something separate. You know, I thought here's religion, here's my relationship with God and here's my career, what I wanted to be my career. And they seemed at odds. 
and they were. And once I finished, my first film was called Girl Crazy and just a romantic comedy, a trifle. That's kind of how I describe it. But it was it was incredible. It took me five years of of uh, work and risk and to to make this film and then to get it into the marketplace. And at the end, you know, it was just this. It was a trifle. It was just, you know, something someone would watch and it'd be enjoyable, but they'd forget about it five minutes after they watched it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's not worth five years of my <laughs> life. And then I had this one uh, really important experience where when I was shopping the film, the film was finished and I was trying to find a distributor to help me get it out into the world to make some money with it. And uh, finally, I found a distributor who was interested and I was sitting across the desk from him. It was in... Uh, he was in Santa Monica, I believe. And um, I mean, it, it was a surreal experience. You know, I'm this Mormon kid. And yes, my movie was a little, you know, girl crazy. It was just very, you know, mainstreamy. Yeah. But um, I'm in this Hollywood distributor's office and he had just finished snorting cocaine and, you know, and, <laughs> and he started to tell me how much he loved, you know, oh, it's a, it's a wonderful movie and what a great title. And, you know, he goes, now I just need you to go back and uh, I want you to cut in some nudity every eight minutes and we're going to sell this thing everywhere. And it was like an out of body experience where I'm mm. sitting across the desk from this guy thinking, how did I get here? And wow. what, wow. how do I respond to this? And what do I do? And I walked out of the office and, you know, just kind of reeling and thinking, um, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I decided, well, I decided I'm not going to cut nudity into the film. And, uh, so I called him up and told him I wasn't going to do that. And he decided to distribute it anyway. But it was after that, that I thought I can't do this. I can't be a, I can't do this. This can't be my career because, yeah, you know, where am I going to be five years down the line? Where am I going to be 10 years down the line? You know, I might be the guy on the other side of the desk. And it was like, I, that's not, yeah. I can't do that, you know? And, uh, so that's when the idea for, I thought I was giving up filmmaking and then I decided, then I realized, wait a minute, you know, I, what, there's all these, uh, independent, you know, in, there's independent cinema for, for black audiences and Indian audiences and gay audiences. And it's like, why can't Mormons have their own cinema? Because there's like 12 million of them and they, you know, they, they, they can see, they love movies. And, <laughs> and so it just immediately I was on fire. And then I spent another five years, you know, putting God's army together and raising the money, making it and then distributing it. Yeah. But that's where it came from. But the whole idea was, I was like, you know, I, I wanted, um, there, there are so few in the history of film. There are so few filmmakers who, who ha have anything, you know, have, have, anything of a, of a spiritual nature to, to who, who, um, who explore faith and God and, and religion at all, really yeah. in any meaningful way. And so yeah. I, what I wanted to do was be like, you know, whenever someone thinks of serious, powerful, spiritual cinema, they would think of the Mormons. That's the way I wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the impetus for God's army was. And then Brigham city immediately afterwards. And here's the DVD thing for that one. Where do I point? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all the cameras, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And so that's where I wanted it to go. But, but, and I used to go around, I was kind of like an evangelist for, for Mormon cinema where I would go to colleges and, you know, anybody who would listen and talk about, I'd say, look now, you know, and God's army was, was very successful. It was in Utah. It was the, um, I, I believe it was the second most successful film of all films, including Hollywood films you know, in the state of Utah. And then in all films, it was the fourth most pop, most profitable film when you look at budget to gross ratio of all the movies. So I was competing with, you know, Warner Brothers and, and beating them. And so I was really, you know, excited, but I would go out and I would speak and I would say, look now, you know, to these Mormon audiences. And I would say, now we have, you know, this is our moment. Now there's a market, yeah, you know, we can yeah. do that. We can tell our stories. And I thought that, all these people would be coming out of the woodwork with, you know, exploring the doctrines and, and exploring, you know, the struggles of having faith in the real world. And, but that didn't happen. It was just, what I learned was nobody else was thinking that way. Yeah. And nobody was ready. I mean, I, I overestimated because I had been in Los Angeles struggling and trying to make it as an independent filmmaker for 10 years before that or more. And so I, this was my thing, but yeah. nobody else was prepared. So as soon as, it was sad because all anybody seemed to hear was there's a market. And so all these people that just wanted to make some money just came piling into, or people that wanted to make movies, but they had never, 
you know, actually put in the work um, and the time to learn how to do it. And, and, and they didn't have the passion. They didn't have the passion for Mormonism. They didn't have the passion for God. They didn't have a passion for movies. They just had a, they just, it was a game to them and it, yeah. and it really hurt the market. So. A, a couple of quick questions. And Jill, I know she wants to jump in here. You know, the, the whole theme that you just brought up about religion and movies, religion and entertainment, faith and entertainment. You're so right. And many evangelical uh, people will remember maybe above my generation that it was literally sinful to go to a theater. Or, you know, if you went to a theater, you know, and, and, and God came back at the same time, you might not go with them because <laughs> you were in the theater. Right. Um, and so there is that thought and, and <clears throat> any kind of thematic thing or anything that you put up there, you know, whether it's a uh, bad language or, or nudity or, you know, sexual stuff or violence or whatever. I mean, that just is the evidence for that. And, uh, the old, uh, Protest the old fundamentalist line was, uh, uh, we don't believe in dancing because it might lead to premarital sex, you know, right. and, and this kind of theater and cards and all this kind of stuff. So it was kind of this vigilant sense that Hollywood was bad. And, and so the fact that you were wrestling and saying, how do I do a movie that's serious and fun or romantic or this and and not have to cross those lines and you're thinking of that in the not in a faith-based market like there are various other places where you can just go watch faith-based movies um but you were thinking about something more broader than that so it's, it's fascinating that you were struggling with that and dealing with that as a latter-day saint and then sadly what kind of followed was and i don't even know if there's a way to to categorize them uh you know, home teachers and uh, singles ward and all this stuff. It seemed like rather than uh, taking advantage of this more um, deeper and more significant and more substantive kind of theater, um, it went for silly and kind of goofy. And uh, And I'm not sure why that happened. Do you have any sense of that? Because I, I do know, like, I was a little bit associated with one called uh, Baptist at our barbecue because I'm an ordained Baptist minister. And I actually have a little line on the front cover of this, of the DVD package, it says, this is one funny movie, you know, Baptist minister, Greg Johnson, you know, and, uh, but the theme there was to try to say that Baptist and Latter-day Saints could, could get together, you know, that they could meet, they could have a barbecue, they could talk with one another. Right. And I thought that was kind of a good, good idea. You know, that's something we're all about here on our podcast. And so, um, you know, just respond to that. Why, why do you think the direction went the way it did when your introduction was so much different? I've thought a lot about that over the years, but then one of the things is I, I realized afterwards, after it had all, you know, played out, that uh, I was very naive. I was very idealistic. And, you know, if I had really looked at it, and it wasn't just cinema, I mean, if I'd looked at, um, you know, LDS theater um, or LDS literature, the, what very little there is, you see, the, uh, there are these amazing like levi peterson's an amazing writer and he did a he did a book called the backslider which i thought was like one of the most amazing and then there was the giant joshua there are these like novels from the lds tradition but they're buried you know it's like they come out and 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 um and they inspire all this other stuff to come out and then they're buried by the other stuff mm. and the other stuff is just so superficial and just so badly written and uh, and so when people think of like mormon fiction they're thinking of things like charlie and a bunch of you know just gar I, I shouldn't say what i almost said um but you know <laughs> i would say as a kid i read charlie as a i was i did too <laughs> as you know i was a, a latter-day saint in my yeah, childhood yeah. and i read that i was very inspired by it so were you really yeah. <laughs> see i remember distinctly i picked up the book because i wanted to be a writer yeah, as a yeah. kid too you know yeah. and so i knew i was going to write movies and i wanted to write books and i remember i was sitting in wendy's in russellville kentucky <laughs> and uh and I just got this book, you know, Charlie, and I, and I read it. You know, it, it takes you like, what, two hours to read or whatever. Yeah, it's a pretty and small book. And I'm sitting in this, and I remember I'm 13 years old, and I finish this book, and I think, what a load of garbage. I'm just thinking, this is like the worst, <laughs> poorly, I could write better than the, at 13. And, um, <laughs> but then, you know, the same thing with um, theater. For instance, there was some great LDS theater. There was, you know, Eric Samuelson was a great... Uh, playwright and uh, even you know Saturday's Warrior that came out in like that there's an interesting example yeah good music you know professionally done music and a good story and you know for the LDS audience it was like perfect yeah you know if, if you're looking at something that would be like 
perfect for the mainstream LDS audience. That was it. Hugely successful. And then what happened afterwards? A bunch of people just jumped in with just really subpar material and, and it just killed it again. It killed it. Huh. It's something that just happens over and over again. And, and I just wonder if, you know, again, I, I think it's just uh, naive. I think the, the, even with 12 million Mormons at the time when I was doing, you know, God's army, how many of those 12 million were artists of any kind yeah. Yeah. of those, how many are writers or filmmakers? Yeah. And of those, how many are serious? How many are trained? How many are, yeah. you know, how many of them actually believe? And then how many of them actually have something important to say? Yeah. And when you think about it that way, you're like, yeah, wow. well, of course, it's just that, not, not that's enough. fascinating. I appreciate your feedback. Uh, I'm, no. Yeah. I'm going to jump in here a little bit. Um, <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that, I think a lot about, and maybe some people in our audience do, is that we feel that God has given us certain giftings or we're good at this, and we'd love to have that transfer into what you're talking about, where it we can use it for God's purposes, and it really mm -hmm. impacts people and changes their lives. I would love to hear just more of your story and how did you fall in love with, with film writing and at what point did it transition to, you know, you actually, right. you did really share about how it transitioned into, I'm going to use this for the Lord, but maybe back right. up a little bit and tell us the yeah, background yeah. to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Before I jump into that, though, there was, um, I was just thinking as we were talking about this, one thing that really um, is interesting is uh, I was very inspired as a young man, like I say, Charlie and what the Mormons were writing wasn't inspiring. Uh, you know, the institutional films that the church was doing weren't inspiring. Um, where I was finding inspiration, oddly, I, I was in the Jewish community. I was reading like Chaim Potok and Isaac Singer. And I was just, you know, and I think what started it was Fiddler on the Roof, where I was like, oh, wow. wow. I felt so connected to these people and all the rituals and the language I, I had zero comprehension of, but their faith you know, and their, yeah. and their traditions. And I identified with them. So even though they were a completely different, um, from a completely different tradition and belief system, they were my people, mm. you know? And so I was reading, and that's something that's really strange. I mean, it, again, going back to, you know, how many, how many Jews are there in the United States? Far fewer than mm. Mormons, you know, and yet they have been so, um, prolific and, yeah. and their influence in the arts have been so powerful right and you know that's something to be admired uh -huh. respected uh -huh. and emulated and um, and i think there's something in mormons are not encouraged to and i say this with affection you know no having grown up in it and lived in it as an adult they're not encouraged to express themselves you know they're not ex they're not um encouraged to explore because the answers are there they're given the answers yeah, you know yeah. and these are the answers that you and so there's a real lack of uh um yes it's an intellectual religion in a sense that's one of the things that drew me as a young man was was you know it was not so emotional and it was more you know books and you know scriptures focus on that and i and that appealed to me but um but it's not a uh it's not a searching, um, exploring, mm -hmm. and, and I really don't think there, there's, there's lip service given to a personal relationship with Christ, but it's a personal relationship with Christ. Christ is here, you're here, and there's a bishop, there's a stake president, there's an apostle, there's a prophet in between. Yeah, yeah. And that, that really, and then, you know, if you, if you want to, I had so many people when I started making these films, God's Army in Brigham City, that were terrified because I was doing it independently. And they're like, did you get permission from the church? And I was like, no, why would I need permission from the church to tell my own story? But that was a foreign concept. Yeah, you know? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I hear you. Uh, All right, but, so but, go back to yeah, you. To you. Yeah, so just share the story about falling in love with filmmaking and how did how, how did that, that all come yeah, about? Yeah, no, it's fascinating because I was, uh, people have often asked me, it's like, when did you decide to be a filmmaker. And I think they think it was in college or something like this, but no, I, uh, um, as a kid, I didn't know anything about Mormonism. Um, uh, my, my grandparents on my father's side were Baptist. My father himself was, a um, eight, he was proclaimed atheist and, or agnostic at least. And then my grandparents on my mother's side were Pentecostal. And so I spent, you know, my first seven years of life, mostly going to the Pentecostal church once or twice a week. And um, 
a tiny little church right across from my grandparents' house. It was, uh, it was beautiful. But um, one of the things about being Pentecostal, at least our, our brand of, of the, the faith was uh, no movies, you know, yeah. no dancing, no <laughs> movies, no cards, no makeup. No, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, Straight. hardcore. And um, so I had never gone to a movie. I had never actually mm -hmm. gone to a cinema. We could watch television, which I don't really understand how that works, but, <laughs> but um, little screens were okay. Big screens were no, no. Um, but anyway, so my parents split up and divorced. And then my mother started dating this Mormon guy who had come into town. We didn't know what a Mormon was, but where, where were you raised? Southern Illinois. Okay. Yeah. Born in Chicago. And then we, you know, I lived a little bit in, in Chicago and then we went to Southern Illinois and uh, that wouldn't be Cesar, would it? No, Cesar, Mount Vernon, Illinois. Mount Vernon. Okay. Do you yeah. know Cesar, Illinois? No, no. It's a super duper small town. A friend of mine is a pastor there. Oh, really? And a former Latter day Saint, by the way. Really? And I, I know, I've never found anybody that knows Cesar, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> wow okay You're... well i'll look for it next I, I go to mount vernon usually once every couple of years so okay. i'll look for it Cesar. but um yeah so this mormon guy comes along starts dating my mom and then he's like let's go to a movie and so i'm probably just barely seven years old and we go to the cinema in mount vernon illinois uh the granada theater which was uh is one of these art big art deco theaters built in the 1920s you know back when you know movies were the thing and so it was this huge theater with a you know beautiful marquee and you walk in and it's a huge lobby with mirrors and posters and it's just beautiful and i was just you know i walked into this place and we were not a wealthy family at okay. all you know i came from a very blue collar you know bartenders and mechanics and truck drivers that kind of thing coal miners and so you know just that in itself you know going from our little tiny house to this beautiful the, and then we go in, sit down, and then the movie starts, and it's John Wayne and the Cowboys. John Wayne and the Cowboys. And I was mesmerized. I was just instantly, uh, instantly just hypnotized by this movie and loved it. I didn't know what it was. You know, I'm watching this huge thing, and I didn't know the difference between acting and directing and writers and anything. All I knew was, wow, wow, wow. And I... I came out of that and I was just alive in a way that I had never been alive before. It was, and I distinctly remember the, the driving home from the theater that night, going to our little house, passing all these buildings that I had seen a thousand times or more every day. And suddenly they were new to me. I mean, it was whole, like the whole world was just suddenly alive in a wow. way that it had never been alive before mm. and my brain i think was alive and i was alive in a way that i hadn't been so from that moment i knew that that's it i don't know what that is i don't know how to do it but whatever that is i'm doing it somehow mm -hmm. and so that and that never really wavered i wow. um it led me you know to try to figure out my family of course we had you know they had nothing to do with entertainment uh, mm -hmm. hollywood and it, so it was completely foreign and they couldn't help me. So I would just, you know, try to learn. It's like, how do you do that? What happened? Oh, you go to Hollywood and how does that work? And so, you know, it led me to try to, it's like, okay, now I need to do a little acting and, and then, oh, which led me into writing, which led me into, if any, if I want my stuff done, I'm going to have to produce it. And I'm, if I'm going to produce it, I'm sure going to direct it because I'm mm -hmm. not going to let anybody else have the fun. And then eventually distributing and it just led to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, the thing that, that hit me a few days ago and which I, which I told you guys about was it struck me how interesting that um, one thing we haven't covered is how this, uh, you know, once I made God's army and suddenly these two different parts or these two very, very important things to me, you know, my relationship with God and, and filmmaking for the first time came together hmm. and they just, you know, suddenly, you know, my, they my, were not odds. Uh, in yeah. fact, they were helping each other. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. like my, my faith and my, my, you know, the striving to have a closer relationship with God and to understand and, and, and to grow, you know, informed my filmmaking. And then the filmmaking, because I was exploring my faith in the films was informing, you know, mm. my, my faith. Uh, and it was just the most beautiful and, and wonderful, you know, time of my life. Um, and then, but what I realized a few days ago was looking back on it. It's so fascinating to me now that, that the Lord gave me 
those two things at the same time. It was like, here's Mormonism and here's cinema. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like, I don't know. I honestly don't know if I would have left Mormonism if I hadn't been exploring my, you know, hadn't been so serious and, and given and had the opportunity to make that my livelihood so that I could spend my whole days just, you know, submerged in the, in the cinematic exploration. That doesn't sound too, you know. Well, it, even just watching God's Army and then States of Grace, you can tell that you're on this spiritual journey where in God's army, you're you're in the LDS church, but you're also coming, like breaking the boxes of, of this mold of how we see Mormon missionaries and, and the rules that they're supposed to follow and what they're supposed to do. You, you really are starting to break that box open. And then with States of Grace, you, you take it a whole new place. I'd love to hear your journey between the two movies and then maybe even right after States of Grace and what that looked like. You've just mentioned that you did leave the LDS church. What what was happening in your heart during these years? Well, after, um, you know, God's Army led immediately to Brigham City, which was a, a darker film. You know, it was a it wasn't like, you know, seven or anything like that um but it was you know it was exploring you know the loss of innocence and uh, you know living trying to live in this world you know have faith while living in this real world and so it was a, a more serious film and right after brigham city i it suddenly clicked for me it was like i had always wanted to make a film about the life of and murder of Joseph Smith, okay. founder of Mormonism. But it was such a big story, I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then after Brigham City, it had just gone into theaters, and suddenly it hit me. And for you know, most of my time after my mission, I had been, you know, whenever there was something new about Joseph Smith, a new book or whatever, I was trying to you know learn, trying to under, you know always putting this information into my head because I knew that eventually I'd want to make a movie about this. So it clicked finally how to do it. And I got so excited. And, um, and uh, I went to one of my investors and he was like, all right, I'll, you know, I'm willing to put in the first million. And, you know, and so we just it got going. And it, before I knew it, I was like uh, um, ready to, I, I was six weeks away from filming. I had sets being built in Canada to create Nauvoo. And I was, uh, I had Val Kilmer to play Joseph Smith and mm. uh, he was excited and, uh, F. Murray Abraham to play Governor Ford. Um, Those are some big names. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so the thing was entirely cast and we were building and then the money all fell away and that's a whole other story. Um, but it took it, that took me away for a while. It took me away because after Brigham City, that's when all the other Mormon films started to come in and I was trying to make this epic, you know, basically the Mormon Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Um, and so when I finally, you know, after that, um, I re when I finally had to set that project aside, um, I took a little time and it was in this time that, that I had this very profound experience. And, uh, um, I was explaining to Marco earlier that, uh, um, it was so it was such a unique thing because i was uh, if i could describe it i was as true believing of a latter day saint as i could be i was you know my not only was my you know elders quorum president all this you know I was constantly ward mission leader i was just passionate i had all my kids we were all mormon we lived in mapleton utah which is 98.9% <laughs> mormon and um so our whole life and my career, I had made my career. I was the father of Mormon cinema. I mean, I had, I had gone all in and not only all, but all in, in my heart too, you know, and yeah, in my mind. Yeah. And I was like trying so hard to live all the 6,000 commandments. <laughs> I was trying to just do them all. And, uh, in, you know, studious and, and prayerful temple going. And, and it was at that point in my life when I was, uh, um, I wasn't, I wasn't stressed. I wasn't seeking. I was just in prayer one day. And after prayer, 
And I, I had been thinking a little bit about some of the things in church doctrine history that I, I didn't know the answers to, but I knew there were answers because it was true. So obviously there were going to be answers. And so I got up from prayer in my room, sat against my, you know, my bed and was just in a, still in a prayerful state. And I, and, and I just asked myself, well, what if it's not true? And then in that instant, this voice that was, um, it's so hard to describe because when people talk about hearing a voice, you know, they think it's something that comes from, you know, it, it for me, it, it wasn't. And, and people say, you know, it's not audible, but it's more than, and that's pretty much, it was like this, this voice from the deepest part of me that was like speaking to every to and from every cell of my body hmm. just said, of course, it's not true. And it, it just, shook me and and the way i describe it is in all honesty 30 seconds before i was a true you know true believing i knew what the universe was i knew who i was i knew who god was and then 30 seconds later i knew that all those things were were not true mm -hmm. and uh, it was the most terrifying moment Absolutely. of my life yeah and I remember this strange sensation of sitting there with my back against the wall and just looking straight ahead. And it was like those science fiction movies in space where, you know, the one ship disengages from the other and it just kind of mm -hmm. goes away and, and you know, it's just going further and further. Right. And there's nothing that's going to, you know, it's just going to continue to drift apart. And that's how, and I could feel that my faith in Mormonism was going and now, that was there was that nothing I could do. Before you made states of grace, or after? That was before. Okay. Yeah, and that's the reason that uh, um, that I tell that story because after that, um, it was such a difficult. I didn't even tell my wife what was going on because I, I mean, I it is if you haven't had an experience like that, it is so hard to describe. I mean, suddenly I was in a hostile universe. Yeah. I didn't know anything and i'd lost faith completely in my ability to discern what's real and what's not real and and uh um and so just continuing this like wow you've got to you know i don't know anything anymore i don't know who god is i don't know i still i still believed in god because that was i knew that was god if uh, that's the one thing i knew that that was god talking to me and but i no longer knew anything about him except right. that he had talked to me and and, and Richard, just real quick, and I don't want to distract the, the next part of the story, but many Latter-day Saints would hear what you just say, and their immediate response would be, how did you know that wasn't the devil speaking to you? He, he led you astray. He pulled you away. He, he put a lie in your head, and you thought it was God, but it really wasn't. Now, classically, amongst conversations with my LDS friends and scholars and others, there's a different kind of apologetic for Latter-day Saint thinking. There is a subjective nature to it. Go and pray, and if you hear from God, I mean, that's a promise in the Book of Mormon, and in, in the Book of Moroni. Pray about this, and if you have a burning in your bosom, or you have a, a sensation, then it's so. And so when you had an experience like that, but in, in, the, in the wrong direction, uh, the, the Latter-day Saint culture would say, you were listening to the devil. Right. How did you know, and how did you wrestle through that? Yeah, and that's exactly what, when I finally was able to go and and put it into words and talk to my bishop and my stake president um that's exactly what you know came yeah, back I was well, that was say, that yeah. was satan and and uh, and uh, i've thought a lot about that over the years and there i mean in a very the best answer i have which has no authority outside of myself and i recognize that is there's no i know there is there's no way that you can that you that 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 is was not god that's the one thing to this day that i know mm -hmm. that that is god yeah yeah and um and i also as a latter-day saint i had had experiences with darker forces with demonic I, and i knew I, I could walk into a room and know you know what that is like mm -hmm. so but again that's speaking from a personal subjective yeah, um yeah yeah and so you know i don't ex i don't expect anyone to accept that I know it. Yeah, you know, yeah. If there's one thing in life I do know. However, there are supports that I think, I mean, at, at that moment afterwards when I started to, when I was trying to, the months and the years after that when I was processing all of this, 
one thing I finally understood too was like, you know, all my, I had been something of an apologist as a Latter-day Saint where I believed so much that there was nothing that anybody could throw at me that I, first of all, I knew that there was an answer to everything. So I was always digging and I was always finding those answers because I was engaged in conversations with all sorts of people and I was always defending the faith. Didn't matter about Joseph Smith's polygamy. It didn't, I, I had an answer for it. Even, you know, him, um, him marrying Orson Hyde's wife when Orson Hyde went off to dedicate the Holy Land, which that took me a week or two to figure a good answer for that one. Um, blacks and the priesthood, didn't matter. I had an answer for it. Um, but what I finally realized, what, what really I think is a, is a real evidence is I kind of look at those things like it's like a forest of trees. And it's like each of these trees, you know, one tree is the blacks and the priesthood. One tree is the polygamy. One tree is, you know, and there's a lot of trees and you can spend, you, you can attack each tree individually and you can just, uh, you can argue back and forth, argue until, you know, you can debate back and forth until eventually you just have to go, okay, well, we've talked it out, no conclusions, move on to the next tree, which is what most people do. Yeah. But when that voice that told me, well, of course it's not true. And then I just realized that that one, that one statement answers all the trees hmm. you know yeah that one yeah. thing is like suddenly all these things all these apologetic reasons and excuses and explanations to support mormonism it's like okay that might work on that tree and it might work on that tree but it doesn't work on 300 trees and yeah. the only thing that works on 300 trees is of course it's not true um and that's the intellectual support right right um, and then the other support is in my life now. That to me is the other, you know, where where the Lord let. Yes, I went through a wilderness after. I didn't go cleanly from Mormonism into Christianity. I had a really hard decade where um, I, you know, I stumbled out of that experience with, um, I still, as I say, I still believed in God. I still believed. I still had faith in Jesus but I had no faith in my own ability to discern truth. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry at God, even though that was his voice. I was like, why did you, I was 39. I was almost 40 when this happened. And I was just like, why, why did you put me through this? You know, why did, you know, to be public and to have to go through that experience of, you know, I couldn't go easily and just go to another church like most people do. I had to like, you know, it was in the newspapers, it was on the news and it was, you know, I was an apostate suddenly in my community and uh, people would give me, you know, nasty looks in the grocery store, that kind of stuff, um, and worse. And um, <laughs> so I was angry, and so I went through a period of just, you know, despair, and just, um, and it was ugly, and it was horrible, and, uh, um, and, and now, but now I have the, be <laughs> the beautiful experience of having the perspective of contrast, because, um, because later, when uh, the Lord reached out and pulled me back home now i have that and now i can contrast that mm. you know, not just with the dark period who in between. you were before and who you are now right and the understandings that this is the and one of the things that's driving me now to make the film that i that i'm going to make next is is this driving desire that i have to speak i'm really speaking to the me of 2004 where i'm trying to reach back and say you know, how I, I see the things that I understand now and that I see and that I couldn't see then, even though, you know, I was I was sincere, I was devout, I, you know, yeah. but there were things that I couldn't understand, things that I see now about grace and and um, and a personal relationship with Christ that that as I was playing to Marco earlier, it was like. The, it was like there was a veil over mm -hmm. over me and and. And I thought I was seeing, I thought I understood. And at that time when people, when I would talk to evangelicals and they would, they would say things like, you know, you don't understand grace. And I'd just be like, Pfft. or, <laughs> you know, you, you believe in a different Jesus than, and that would send me off. You believe in a different Jesus than we do. And I, I would just be like, you know, I was incensed and offended and, and it was, they were so ignorant. And, uh, now seeing it from the other point of view, um, they were right in a lot of ways, you know, they were right. And there were things that I could not see and things that, that, um, because of, uh, boy, how would I even describe this? It's like, um, the way that I had been programmed to think and to interpret, to read the scriptures, 
the way that I had been taught, you know, to have a relationship with God and how that all worked, all those things kept me from, I could read, I was, I was very studious. I could read the Bible. I read it, you know, I read the Bible, like the New Testament seven times, the Old Testament twice, like trying to understand every word and verse. And, uh, but still, when you've got this veil over your understanding, you're not seeing it. You're not, you can read over the words and you think you understand them and you don't see them. And then later, and I think it's, it really is an act of, of grace when the Lord lifts the veil at some point mm -hmm. and you suddenly see, and it's one of the most powerful experiences that you can have. So I kind of, I'm passionate now because I want to, I want to help. I know a lot of people now are leaving the LDS church. Um, when I left, I was, you know, people left then too, but not as many. And, and, uh, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have good resources and I didn't have anybody to help the community of support or right. Yeah. I just went, okay, out into the wilderness. And, um, and so in my approach now, um, in the film that, that we'll, we'll talk share, about soon. Yeah. Share with us how you came to be doing another film and, and where you, well, if I could, I want to interject here just quickly, because I think we need to speak to our audience, you know, here at Building Bridges with Greg and Joe, we have had all kinds of conversations. We've had conversations with uh, politicians about how to integrate faith in the political system. We've had prominent LDS uh, guests who are involved with the chosen or uh, influencing with multiply goodness. And so I hope that that our audience, as we're list as they're listening um, one of the one of the great tenets of of a, of a well known theologian uh, by the name of Christian Christian Stendhal, who was a Lutheran bishop of Sweden, he was the one that said, "Always leave room for holy envy when you're in conversation with people who believe differently than you." Meaning simply that maybe I don't agree with you, but maybe there's something I can learn. Maybe there's something that's of value. You know, don't don't just dismiss people completely. Think about what they're saying. And so I want to ask our audience who are LDS, you might be hearing the story and feeling angry or frustrated or, no, that's not the way it is, and we're not like that, and that's not true, and da-da-da. But, but I don't think it's fair for us to argue with somebody's testimony. Your story is authentically your story. And when a Latter-day Saint person or an evangelical person or a Catholic person or whatever hears a story of faith that is faith-affirming, and this person came from a life of sin and became a, a follower and a believer and a authentic, you know, we rejoice over that. We think that's wonderful and it's, it helps us feel good about our own faith. But when somebody leaves our faith or questions our faith or doubts our faith, then somehow we have to figure that out too. And we kind of want to just say, well, they have a problem. They're, mm -hmm. they're into sin. They're struggling with that. They're, they're probably got some real mm -hmm. skeletons in their closet. And I just want to ask our audience to, to not do that because that's, that's the easy thing. That's the cheap thing. Uh, just to to disagree and dismiss. The 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 more genuine thing is to say, okay, I don't agree with this, but I'm going to listen. I'm going to try to hear this guy out, and I'm going to try to give him a fair shake. And I hope that building bridges with Greg and Jill does that because that's what we're about. If people come from a perspective A and a perspective B, and they just you know, entrench themselves and they put up their flag and they stake their ground and they fight back and forth. Very little good, I think, comes right. from that. A lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of heat, but not very much light, as they say. Right. And so maybe B and A can say, "Hey, you know, you're not my enemy, so at least we can sit down and visit. We can talk. We can have a conversation." And with Robert Millet, the BYU professor friend that I have and retired dean of the Faculty of Religion, we have seen many, many in in our programs and things that we've done together, where a Latter Day Saint person would come up to us at the end of a presentation and say. You know, my, my son left our church to become an evangelical. And we haven't spoken in years. But because of what you guys did tonight, I'm going to call my son tomorrow. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that we saw happening. You know, my, you know, my uh, whatever, you know, became a Latter-day Saint, and it's broken up our family. Right. And, and we can't just like the faith-affirming stories. We've got to deal with the reality of, of, of all of this. So again, please listen in and maybe you don't agree with Richard. Maybe you think his story is wrong. Maybe you think he did hear from Satan and not from God, but it's his story and you have your story and you wouldn't like it if somebody just dismissed your story because you, they didn't agree with it. But there is something, like you said, in evidence that what became of your life, I mean, eventually that 
that statement was tested in the in the next decade that you had it was so hard and difficult and then as you began to deepen a new faith a new relationship with god right you're like hey i i think that you know i think it proves for me at least that what what i heard was what i heard right and right. so i i just think that little commentary is helpful for us because you know, I know. I mean, honestly, if I can just be uh, biographical here, when I was a 14-year-old kid and went to a, a Christian camp in Colorado Springs, I was armed with my King James Bible, my ironic priesthood, and I, I told my mom before I left for camp, uh, summer of 1980, hey, don't worry about me. These Christians won't get me. You know, I've got my King James Version. I've got my priesthood. I'm just going to enjoy camp. I'm just going with Eric and Matt. We're going to have a lot of fun. And whatever they do religiously, I, I'll, be, I'll be fine. You know, I can defend myself. And through the chapels and Bible studies and singing times, I'm just opened up to a world that I don't understand and I just never heard. And I actually asked my, my little Baptist friend, uh, what's a prodigal? You know, because the guy was talking about the prodigal son. And next thing I know, I'm lying that I know about that because I don't want my Baptist friend to think he knows more about God than I do. <laughs> and I'm thinking, why did I just lie about that? I, but I knew that I did. And so by the end of that week, I had some questions, some thoughts, and I went right back home to my bishop, and I would have meetings with him, and I'd say, they said this, but we believe this, and how do we jive that? And and uh, and when I eventually decided at that time, and I, I know I was only 14, but as, as some of my critics will say, uh, you were just 14, you couldn't have known, and then I say, you don't want to make that argument, because there was another kid that was 14 years old. <laughs> right, good point, good point. And, uh, and you believe that story, you know, but in, in the process of that, I... I did not become, like some do, angry. I was, you know, I was young, 14 and a half, when I ended up leaving. But I told my bishop and the first and second counselor at my bishop's court, I'm not angry. I'm not mad. I just want to make sure I'm believing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if, if I leave to, to follow Jesus and make sure he's number one in my life, then the Lord can tell me, go back to the LDS church because that's where I want you to be. Right. Or he can lead me elsewhere. And that's the way I approached it. And about four months later, Richard, I was in California with a family friend, an adult. And here I am talking with him out in front of his uh, house. And he says, you know, you used to be such a devout Latter-day Saint. What, what's changing you? Why do you not believe that anymore? Why do you not go to the LDS church anymore? And I remember just going, I don't have a good answer for that. But, but it's for me... It, it, it's either of God or not of God, and, and, and I thought it was of God, and now maybe I don't think it's of God. And, and, and so we, the journey itself was hard. I mean, even for a kid to just think, what, what am I saying when I choose to, you know, am I just saying I don't want to go to that particular church anymore, or am I saying that there's real problems here? I don't know, but it, it set up a life for me that I began to have to explore and struggle and read and pray and think and meet others. And, and that, you know, I don't think that led me to a bad place. I think today as I sit here, I'm very grateful for the hard journey because I, right. I think my relationship with Jesus Christ is more profound, more real, more authentic than anything I ever have. And believe me, Jill and I have lots and lots of LDS friends and our desire is not to convert them to our religion. Mm -hmm. our, our, our every conversation is about what do you think of Jesus and what's, what's grace right. mean to you and, mm -hmm. and how, how do you work these things out in your life? I don't, I don't care about converting people to a religion. I just want to make sure that everybody I know understands Jesus loves them, he forgives them of their sin, and if they pray to put their trust in him, they can receive this gift called eternal life and salvation and forgiveness. And so we, we leave it at that level, and then we let God decide where they're right. going to go and how they're going to take the next steps. And we're hopefully going to walk with them. But I hope our audience understands that's the heartbeat here. It's not to be dumping on the Latter-day Saint Church. Your, your story, authentically told, through God's army, then through States of Grace, and then what's happened since— um, Man, I'm intrigued by it. I'm 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 fascinated by it. Yeah, well, a lot of people think. I mean, a lot of people just believe that when you leave, a lot of Latter Day Saints believe that when you leave, um, that you that you are suddenly an anti Mormon. Yeah. You know, that you're yeah. that you're angry and that you're and um, uh, I on it at this point where I've arrived now, it's like I have a I have great affection for my. For, for my Latter-day Saint brethren and sisters. And, and people ask me, are you, you know, now that you're no longer LDS, you know, are you ashamed of your movies? Do you wish you hadn't made them? I'm like, no, are you kidding me? I, I'm proud of them. I love them. They were sincere expressions of my faith journey at that time. And I'm so grateful that I've, 
that I've got them a record of that. And, um, and as far as, you know, the latter day scene, I was one of them. I, you know, I, I, in a, in a way I still, I, I, the saddest thing for me leaving the LDS church was that I didn't believe that it was true anymore. I wanted it to be yeah. true. Yeah. I, I did so much. Yeah. And it was the grief. It was like a, when you leave the church, if you were a believer, some people I think aren't, weren't really believers when they leave, it's not such a big deal to me. It was, it yeah. was like yeah. worse than a death. It was, it was a grieving process that still in a sense goes yeah. on. It's yeah. still, it's still there. And you go through all the process, you know, the whole process of grief. You think you're losing your mind, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And people, so many people said to me, you know, when I was leaving the church, it's like, oh, you're taking the easy way out. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah. It was like the easy thing would have been to stay, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, to just pretend. Of course, I would have died inside, but, you know, the easy thing would have been to just stay, to keep making. I had a friend say, you're an idiot. Why don't you just keep, you know, just pretend you believe and keep making movies. I'm like, I... I can't do that. That yeah. would kill me. Yeah. That would destroy yeah. me inside. Yeah. And it would destroy my relationship with God to be, you know, to, to whether or not anyone believes that this experience I had was of God to me, I believe, you know, I believe it. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. anyone listening to me accepts that I believe it. Yeah. Yeah. To deny that voice. That would be the wrong thing to do. That, that would be, you know, perhaps unforgivable to do. Um, at least it would be, as far as I view my life, it would be an unforgivable choice. I wouldn't be able to forgive myself for that kind of a choice. And when you leave, for me, it'll cost me everything. You know, yeah. it cost me my career. All my investors fled. My reputation was gone. My, uh, it cost me my marriage. Uh, it, it was horrible, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And yet, I understand the, the, the point being, now I look back on the whole process, and I still get, I'm not angry with church members I can get angry at the leaders, um, uh, some of whom I know personally or I've met personally, and um, I can get angry at them, but not the Latter Day Saints. And when I, even the work that I'm doing now, um, I I refuse to. I'm not an anti Mormon. I refuse to. I don't. I refuse to let anyone classify me as an okay, anti Mormon. Okay. It's just yeah, not right, true. Right. Yeah. Know? But again, the kind of films that I make. I'm trying to, uh, this, I, I want to continue to, during my time in the wilderness, I made, you know, comedy, horror movie. I made whatever meaningless trifles. <laughs> but um, now that I'm back, now that I, I'm continuing, now I'm putting that, that rope back together, you know, where yeah. my spiritual life and my, and um, mm. my filmmaking are together again. Yeah. And I'm continuing that journey um, toward and with God. And, um, and so I'm going to continue to, I'm just going to tell my story as authentically as I can, which is why I'm telling this particular story because it, his journey is very similar to mine. Yeah. But let me get to the point of, you asked me about my, my, yeah, uh, I was going to say, going back to Jill's question, we just did a little, uh, we took a diversion. little diversion there. Yeah. D divergence. Wait, what's the word? A diversion. Diversion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So, cause, cause now a new project is before you that we've heard about. And right. we're pretty intrigued by it. And so begin to tell us what, what's laying ahead. I think I, the only way I can tell that is to... Um, or is it lying ahead? Laying ahead, lying ahead. I'm sorry. I believe it's... <laughs> it's ahead. It's, it's ahead. In the future. It's in the future. <laughs> um, but I, I think an important part of the story is how I... I mean, it's hard to tell the story of how the project came to be without telling the story about how I how the Lord pulled me back um, home. And... Um, and that uh, we referred, you know, of my period when I was just stumbling around making horror movies, just, you know, not in a good place, in a dark place, very um, kind of hopeless, living in a, in a kind of a hopeless, cynical existence and uh, um, not interested anymore. And in, because of my experience with Mormonism, I, I wanted nothing to do with any churches, you know, at all. It's like just there's no way I'm going to go through that again. Um, I was still a, you know, prayerful, like in my personal, you know, t in a personal space, private space, I would, I, I still believed enough to pray. Um, and this is why this story is so miraculous to me because I was at a, I was, uh, at the time, I think I was like 300 pounds. I was just like, you know, I, I was just sad. So I was eating, I was drinking. I was just like 
in a bad place. But I was at Carl's Jr. downtown and uh, just standing in line to get my double cheeseburger and whatever else I was going to get. And um, there was this big dude behind me. He was like a big, you know, he's like, he looked like a biker guy. He had long hair and a beard and he had tattoos all over and kind of ratty clothes. And, you know, I was aware of him just because I'm like, this guy's behind me. And uh, pretty soon he like taps me on the shoulder and he's like, hey, you're Richard Dutcher. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. And he said, yeah, you are. You're Richard Dutcher. And I said, no, no, I'm not. I, uh, you know, sometimes I get that. And he goes, no, he, and he wouldn't fall for it. You know, he's like, he's like, no, you're, you're Richard Dutcher. And that's finally, I admit it. And then he introduced himself and he said he was a pastor. And at that didn't, point, didn't you know, fit the bill. <laughs> at that point, it was like, you know, I was kind of talking to him over my shoulder. And then at that point, it's like, turn around and like what and uh yeah i explained he was a pastor and then i looked and i noticed that the tattoos on his arms were like a cross and other christian symbols and he was a he was really friendly gregarious guy and i was just really interested in him yeah and he said uh he said hey i'd really like to you know buy you dinner or lunch sometime and and talk to you you have an interesting story and so um i was so intrigued by him that i agreed which was which was really unexpected, you know, if, to think that if somebody had said, you're going to go into that Carl's Jr. and there's going to be a pastor and you're going to agree to go to lunch with him, I would have been like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> Particularly where you were at that point in your right, life. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And and then I went to, uh, a few days after that, we met up at uh, Market Street Grill and uh, had a dinner and he was telling me his story and I was telling my story and I just realized, I like this guy. This guy's fascinating. Yeah. And then he just threw out there, he's like, oh, we do a Bible study and we do a, you know, I do this uh, kind of a church thing on Sunday. Come around if you want and just no pressure. And uh, and I thought, hey, I want to, I like this guy. I want to go see what he preaches, what he does. And so I went in there and, uh, and, um, had such a profound experience of, of feeling of coming home. That, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a particularly, in a few weeks after, I, I, I would go every Sunday for a few weeks and, and one particular just beautiful experience happened. And I, and I just, uh, it was the, you know, the, the Lord's spirit just came into me and let me know that I was home. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, um, if not, you know, I was at least had opened the door and taken the first step <laughs> in. And, um, and then at that point, you know, I began to study the Bible more, you know, like, you know, I began to really study it again. Open, I hadn't opened it in years, you know, and I, I opened it again and uh, started to pray and uh, started to get to know these people and uh, just to fall in love with these real genuine Christians. And, and at the time, it was like uh, one of the testaments to me that these were real Christians was, you know, the, this, this guy would preach and talk about that it's all his focus was on love and that's what really responded to me you know that that's what i responded to was was uh he was just like you know didn't concentrate on he's like it you know whatever your your thing you know if you've got alcohol problems drug problems sex problems whatever it's like you're welcome here and you know we're all just studying the word and trying to you know trying to um understand god's word mm -hmm. and i responded to that um and then it turned out that it was true because I watched other people come in, come and go, and the way that these people would interact with them was something that was very different than I, than I had ever known. Mm. And uh, one night in particular, <laughs> I, I stumbled in. Uh, I had actually, I'd been drinking, and for some reason, you know, was, I realized, oh, it was like a Wednesday night or something. Time for church. church service. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> oh, it's church. All right, I'll go. You know, being an, being a drunken idiot, and I just you know I actually went to church drunk. Oh my goodness! I walk in the back and uh, stumble down. You know, and I, I actually you know chose a seat right in the middle, and uh, there were like folding chairs. And as I'm walking in, you know, to get my stumble, you know, and like kick the chairs around and plop down, and um, and uh, Sean, the pastor, he just you know he looks up at me, you know, he's in the middle of reading some Bible verse and he looks up at me and uh, notices, <laughs> sees the condition I'm in. And you see this big smile just come over his face and he chuckles and then he goes back to reading. <laughs> and um, and they didn't treat me any differently. They were mm. just like... Um, just, Way cool, yeah. You know, Sounds like they loved you and they were very authentic with you. Right, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that, I mean, that was 
powerful to me. You know, yeah. they were looking at me and the mess that I was in at that part of at that point in my life, and just like, we love him anyway. He's our brother. We love him. Mm-hmm. You know, and that just that made a big that was powerful powerful thing to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, but then to accelerate the story, let's jump ahead <laughs> um, a year or two ahead after um. I've become much more, you know, I'm much more in the word and praying, you know, and just feeling. And, and I came to that place again where I had been after Girl Crazy, where it was like um, feeling again, like I can't be a filmmaker and a man of God. And I really, when it comes down to it, as much as I love filmmaking, I want to, I want a powerful relationship with, with my God more than anything. Um, and how do I, and if I have to do that, I have to give it up. And so I was again in that place where I found myself praying, just whatever, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. You know, if you want me to go be a missionary in, in uh, you know, Argentina or Africa or wherever, just tell me that and I'll do that. Uh, but just let me know what you want me to do. Uh, and please make it clear because kind of thick skulled sometimes make it clear. And uh, so, Within a few weeks of me beginning to pray earnestly, constantly for this, to know what I needed, to, what I what I should do, I had this friend who kept saying, you know, I'd see him at Bible study, and he'd be like, uh, his name was Danny, and he'd he'd say, oh, there's this there's this video on YouTube. It's 17 minutes long. It's about this Mormon missionary who went to a mission in Florida, and while he was there, he became a born again Christian, and uh, you gotta watch this. And I remember the first time he told me that, and I'm just my eyes are. I'm trying to keep them from rolling back into my head. And I'm just like, I don't want to watch this. And and I don't care. But, you know, I was like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, I'll watch it sometime. Never did. And then he kept after me. You know, every week he'd bring it on. And so one, one Saturday night, finally, I was like, okay, I'm going to see Danny tomorrow. I'm going to watch this video so uh, you can stop talking to me about it. And so I flip open my computer, find it on YouTube, and I start watching. And about – and I got to say – one thing I knew was I was willing to give up filmmaking and I thought I would have to, but one thing I really, I did not think I would ever make another movie that had anything to do with Mormonism pro or con. It just was something I, I wanted to move on. You know, I didn't, Mm -hmm. I didn't want that. And so when I start watching this video of this, and he seemed like such his name is Micah Wilder. And he was telling his story about being a, missionary in in florida an lds missionary in florida and then how he tried to convert a uh, baptist minister yeah this he wrote the, his story in this book passport, this book, to, passport heaven. to heaven yeah yeah and um so and this had not come out at the time so it was just the video and i was watching it and by the way that video has basically gone viral has it not i mean yeah. isn't there yeah. multi-million I don't know how many views. I mean, there's a yeah, lot of last views. Last time I checked, it was, what, two million or more? Yeah, I, it's, I, it's remarkable. Wow. Yeah. But I started watching it, and he and it was, and it was a, uh, again, my, my state of mind going into it was like, all right, I'll, I'll get through this just so that I can say that I watched it. And as I started watching it, it was like, I just was drawn and drawn, and, and it was, it and it was like the the best way to describe it. I felt like I had a guardian angel on each shoulder and one behind, just pushing my head towards the computer, and just being like this. And, and I somehow I just knew in my heart it was like I was drawn, and I just realized I realized within seven minutes I was like, I'm gonna make a movie about this. Mm. Mm, mm. And I had to stop it, you know. I had to stop it because the experience was so powerful. Not so much what was happening there on the screen, but what was happening inside me. And then I watched it and then I watched it a couple more, the whole thing a couple more times. And I just had this feeling of like, wow, I'm going to make a movie about a LDS missionary who becomes a born again Christian. And uh, it just, it kind of just blew my mind. And um, so the next day I talked to Danny and he's like, did you watch that video? I'm like, yes, I watched it. And uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> wow. And do you, do you, and I asked him, I was like, do you know these guys? Do you know this guy? Do you know how I can get a hold of him? And he's like, no, no, but they have a website. You can. So I went online and found the ministry, Adams Road Ministry website, and they had a phone number on it. So I left a message on the phone and I just said, hey, my name's Richard Dutcher. I'm a filmmaker. I don't know if you 
had seen any of my previous work, but I was LDS and now I'm not. And, uh, I saw your, your video on YouTube. And, um, if you're at all interested in exploring, maybe turning this into a movie, please let me know. Here's my number, blah, 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 click. And, and then I walked away and, and part of me was hoping, okay, he's never going to call back. It's like, all right, they're not interested or <laughs> they've already signed with, uh, somebody else to make a movie. It's like, good, good, good. Um, so I could get out of it. <laughs> because I still didn't know it's like okay how am I going to tell this story though it's like it's a story but how am I going to tell it anyway a few days passed I hadn't heard anything and uh finally I get a phone call and it's Micah and he's like hey he's, yeah so I got your message he's playing it very cool you know he's like ah, I got your message and uh yes I'm familiar with your your work and please yeah, we're, uh, we're interested in turning this into a movie. And I said, well, great. Well, let's, you know, I was thinking maybe, you know, sometime you're going to come to Salt Lake, we'll meet or, you know, I'm just kind of putting it in the future. And he's like, yeah, well, we own a, he goes, we own a bed and breakfast in Florida and we'd love to fly you down and put you up and talk about it. And again, I'm thinking, oh, okay, cool. That, that sounds good. Thinking two or three weeks in the future. And then I think this was a Tuesday. And then he says, how about uh, Thursday? <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, why not? You know, why not? So I get on a plane, go down. Micah picks me up at the airport, takes me to the hotel and we talk. And, and I just, uh, I find him to be as genuine in person as he is, as he, as he was in that video. And, um, and then I got to know the other people in the ministry that run the bed and breakfast, the Edgewater Hotel in Winter Garden. And, um, and I just, uh, I just fell in love with all of them. And, um, and again, that to me, the, I, I have this recurring feeling of coming home. Like I had, you know, going to the first Bible study, you know, and, and continually getting, it's almost like, you know, the, the mansion just going a little deeper and deeper inside. Mm -hmm. And that first night that I uh, <laughs> got to winter garden at the hotel, everybody else goes to sleep. I walk out, there's a little fountain right outside the hotel and I'm sitting there just looking at the hotel, looking around. And again, it was that feeling of this is where I'm supposed to be. I just, mm -hmm. it's like, I knew this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And it was the first time I'd had that feeling in so long that it was such a, a powerful experience. And then I got to know, again, I got to know everyone there and we all decided, yeah, let's, you know, let's, let's make a movie. And, and I'm, I say, well, Mike is about halfway through working on his manuscript. And so I say, well, I'm going to, it's going to take me a while to work on the script. So, you know, please give me the manuscript that you have. Uh, and as you, as you're working on more, writing more, please give that to me. And then I just wanted to meet with everybody that had anything to do with mm -hmm. his story, including the Pentecostal minister and the Baptist minister and his family and all the, everybody. And um, so, you know, he hooked me up with all these people and, and, um, and, and I said, well, this is going to take a while. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to just keep flying back down to Florida and then Micah said, well, why don't you just move in here? Hmm. And uh, I thought, all right, I'll just move. <laughs> I just <laughs> move to Florida. Florida. Come back to Utah, pack up all my stuff, and I'm off uh, to Florida. It sounds like it all kind of came together pretty quickly. Did Had Micah talked about doing a movie before? Was why? How did it all happen so quickly? <laughs> yeah, that was a, I didn't know until later, but a beautiful, a, a beautiful confirm. I didn't really need a confirmation because when I saw that video on YouTube, I knew that this that is was what the Lord wanted me to do. Yeah. When I went to Winter Garden, I knew that this is where the Lord wanted me. I just knew it inside. Hmm. And, um, but as we got to know each other better, and I was living with them, the the all of them in the ministry, so we got to know each other extremely well, loved each other. And, uh, I mean, really came to love them. And then once, you know, once we really knew each other, Micah told me a story about how shortly after his mission, when he returned to uh, Florida, and then he knew that he was going to write it into a, a manuscript form, into a book form. And as he was beginning to work on that, so this would have been back in like 2008, he, uh, he was talking to Max, who was his kind of the kind of a mentor uh, in his in his um, conversion to uh, Christianity and and a, a bit of a father brother figure for him. They were they were talking um, 
both devout Christians now, and they were saying, we, we think this could be a movie. Micah said, I, I think this could be a movie. Mm -hmm. and, and Max said, yeah, it could be. And, and Micah said back in like 2008, he said, well, if this ever becomes a movie, I'd want Richard Dutcher mm -hmm. to direct it, to make it. And because he had seen, you know, yeah. my previous yeah. work and yeah. knew that I had left the church. Um, and, uh, and then he asked Max, he goes, do you think we should reach out to him? Mm -hmm. And they, um, they kind of prayerfully considered this, thought about this. And, and then Max said, no, I feel, you know, when the time's right, he's going to come to us. Mm. Mm. And, uh, so Mike is like, okay, you know, continued on. Uh, and then years later, this would have been, you know, 2015, 2016, Mike is well into the, you know, the book, he's starting to really feel like, it's like, wow, this really, we need to, if, if there's going to be a movie, gosh, we got to get this going, you know? It's like, I got to finish this manuscript and I want to get this movie going. And and so he's talking to Max again and he says, do you think we should, uh, do you think we should reach out to Dutcher? And Max again, they, again, they think about it. He's like, no, I just, when the time's right, he's going to come to mm -hmm. us. And Micah, I, Micah, I don't think Micah was very happy with that, <laughs> you know, answer, but he's kind of like, okay. So the point being, <laughs> when I left that message on their machine, um, I always thought, you know, three year, you know, three days, you know, for them to not respond for three days, you know, is like, oh, maybe they weren't that interested. Mm -hmm. But actually, I guess it had been a little bit of a, it was like, wow. Hmm. Um, and Micah, of course, uh, Micah, we'd never had any. I didn't know him. I didn't even know of him till I saw wow. that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about the story. And so, uh, to all of us, you know, to everyone in the ministry, that was, uh, you know, one more confirmation that that um, that the Lord is uh, behind this project. Yeah. So, so you're moving forward, and do you have a title for the movie? Do you, you know, where are you at in the process of? Yeah, well, the the book is Passport to Heaven, and um, um, I felt like for the movie, it was a we needed a different title. Um, for for various reasons you know one thing you know, a lot of things that drive movies i thought passport to heaven was a little too generic it didn't really send you know tell what the movie was about um and and when i was writing the script i was uh um i i had you know access to the manuscript as it was evolving but because i was interviewing everyone else too and i realized i realized that the structure that micah takes in, in writing the book the way that he structures it and tells it you know it works wonderfully for the book but i realized that that's not going to work for the movie um and i was going to have to approach it you know differently and i wanted it to be uh uh, I have no interest. I've made enough movies now. I have no interest in just making another movie. Yeah, yeah. I don't care. You know, yeah. it's like I could retire and never make another movie and be perfectly happy. But uh, so if I make another movie, I want it to be amazing. I want it to be the best thing I've done. I want it to be just, I want it to be something that's worth, you know, however many years of my life and however much risk and, and work that it takes, I want it to be worth it. And um, like I say, you know, when a movie takes years sometimes to put together. That's a lot of life, you know, yeah, and, yeah, uh, sure. and my life, especially as my, my years are advancing, <laughs> I don't have a lot of that left. Right, I want right. to, you know, make it count. And, um, and so, uh, I took a, I took a long time, you know, making sure that this script was, I want it to be the best, not only like the best, one of the best Christian movies ever made, faith-based movies ever made. I want it to be, and not only the best movie I've ever made, but I want it to be, you know, compete with, I want Martin Scorsese and Francis Coppola to watch, and Steven Spielberg <laughs> watch this movie and be like, wow, that was a good movie. Well done. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Just like when I was making the LDS films, I wanted to, you know, I, I didn't just want to make movies. I wanted to, you know, make amazing movies and, and movies that mean something. And again, even since that time, if you were to think of how many film, and I'm not talking about just how many filmmakers in the history of film really explore, you know, questions of faith and uh, religion and spirituality and, and our individual relationships with, with God, so few, you know, and um, it's one of the things that excites me about this is you think on its surface, when I tell people, it's like, what are you working on now? And I'm like, oh, I'm working on this true story about a, a Mormon missionary who, while he was a missionary, became a born-again Christian. Most people are just like... <laughs> and and uh, I have to admit that that's not a great pitch. It sounds, you know, what, but, oh my gosh, what a story. When I mean, yeah. and it's not, so, it's like in how it's told. Who are the characters? How, And uh, 
And one thing I find so invigorating as a filmmaker, thing that drives me, um, is filming scenes that have never been filmed before. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had that experience before where, you know, most, almost any film, I don't care what kind of film, what genre of film it is, it's been done how many times before? Any yeah. scene, you know, it's been done. And it's like, okay, so let's do it like Scorsese. Let's do it like De Palma. Let's do it like, you know, and very, and whenever somebody comes up with a new fresh angle, it's, it's exciting. But how many times uh, I had that experience in God's army when the guy kneels down to pray and it was like, I have to somehow without any dialogue, um, I have to show what's happening between this young man and God in prayer. How do I do that? Hmm. And um, I didn't have anybody to, you, I couldn't go in and look at anybody. There's there, that scene had never been done before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it was exciting. And then I pulled it off and I was like, wow, that's exciting. And then later I, you know, the same thing in, in States of grace. Um, but now, you know, those were like, uh, uh, you know, those, it's like biting off more than you can chew, but I chewed it and I swallowed it. <laughs> and now it's like, I'm biting off like the biggest, you know, biggest bite of all in this story because taking a, it, what it is really is what, and I think one of the things that, uh, um, <laughs> my experience was different in a way, but Micah and I ended up in the same place. Mm -hmm. We began in the same Got place. Yeah. We ended in the same place. Our journey to that was different. Very different. And yet yeah. I understand that, in a, you know, I served an LDS mission. I know what that is. I, I basically grew up LDS. I know what that is. And and uh, as I said before, when the veils were lifted and then I suddenly understood grace and I understood the Lord uh, and my relationship with him in such a different way. Yeah, yeah. And the challenge, how do you communicate that in a film? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you communicate yeah. that transformation, that that arc? People talk, you know, that's, the, that's what makes a great movie generally, a, a character who goes from you know, one place to another undergoes a great change. A lot of the, you know, the greatest movies and plays, that's what, that's what we respond to. And to take that, um, and for me to be able to, as the entire, throughout the entire writing process, and I'm sure that throughout the entire process of directing the film, I'm going to be thinking of me in 2004. Yeah. And how do I tell this story in a way that that he, that that person will not only listen, yeah, yeah, but that he'll see, that he'll understand. How could I save myself that ten years in the wilderness by, and uh, and oh my gosh, there are scenes in this movie that uh, that have never been done before, mm -hmm. and and uh, and I'm going to be, you know, you know, you're going to do it <laughs> with, and I and I'm going to be asking the Lord every day, every minute. It's like you know. Let's do this. Let's let's uh, let's take what I've always wanted to do was, uh, um, you know, not just make movies, not but to actually elevate them in some way. I love cinema. I I, I want to just serve it in a way as mm -hmm. the, the same way that I want to serve the Lord is. You know, I want to do. I, I want to lift it a little bit. I want my participation in it to advance it a little bit yeah you know yeah. i don't want to be someone who degrades it yeah. i want to be someone who comes and advances it a little bit sure and uh and i really 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 want to uh, to uh save some people because I, I, again those people who do leave the lds church whether people you know i mean it happens so people may agree or disagree with that choice but those who do most of them i'd say 90 percent of them go into um atheism hedonism and mm -hmm. just kind of lose all the faith and uh and there's another there's another route you know yeah, and yeah, i want to yeah. show them that so anyway well so. you know I, as you're about ready to show that you know i i'm actually hearing and i know you actually brought this up in god's army 2 or the states of grace as, as it became titled there was that old sentiment back once upon a time that you know to embarrass the church to to embarrass the lds faith on a mission would be like tantamount to the worst thing you could do and and that story is kind of discussed in in the life of one particular young missionary in that in that picture and the whole idea to to um to um you know struggle through what what you might do and not to uh not to bless or encourage or or, or strengthen um 
the testimony of of the faith is is certainly challenging, uh, but. I kind of lost my point there. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what it is that I was exactly going to say, but I just know that this um, this story and knowing a little bit about it, knowing Micah and knowing his family, there's great potential in this kind of being a place where people can say, "Hmm, this might help me." You know, this might this might help yeah. me process my own journey. Yeah, 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 yeah. and and like I I can talk to you know ex Mormons and Mormons. Uh, um, but pretty much ex Mormons, no matter what path they've gone now, if they've gone, you know, away from belief of any in anything, oh. or if they've gone into a church, it's like I, I, I can talk to them. I understand. I know what that is. Well, I just remembered what I was going to say. That the idea that you said that so many who leave faith jettison all faith, the, the right. faith in God. So you're a faithful Latter Day Saint. You get disenchanted. You start asking questions. You start having doubts. You go through this decision process. And then you just say, if if that's not true, then nothing's true. Right. And if, if if that belief system was not uh, genuine, then I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry, and and have a good life, and and just enjoy things. And I actually know Latter Day Saints today who have been sharing with me, in contrast to the to the old thinking, you know, I would rather have my son or daughter embrace evangelicalism than to just embrace hedonism and right. sin and just all this right. and and that by itself is an interesting transition you know that that you know i think in the past you know leaving the faith to become another religion was kind of apostasy at the worst level you know but today i think many even in the lds community are saying abandoning all faith is is not good i mean yeah. it's probably better to have some faith in something than to just totally go off the deep end and, and yeah. go crazy yeah that's one of the thing, one of the blessings that I've recognized in my in my life was when because I was raised the first seven years of my life as a Pentecostal basically, um, I, I had I had a uh, an introduction to Jesus before I knew anything about Mormonism, mm -hmm. so I always there was always a little bit of a separation. Of course, I believed when I was a Latter Day Saint that it was the Church of Jesus Christ, and so but um, but. The fact, I mean, the point being that when, when I had that experience, when God told me what he told me, even after that, I, I, you know, I was able to separate, you know, to some extent, Jesus from Mormonism. Now, most mm -hmm. people who are Latter-day Saints who have grown up and been Latter-day Saints their whole lives, it's all intertwined to such a degree. I mean, Jesus and Joseph Smith are basically walking hand in hand. And so when they toss out Joseph Smith... I understand. They just automatically mm -hmm. toss out Jesus along with that, not recognizing that, boy, there was Jesus, you know, long before 1830. <laughs> and uh, um, and that, you know, you can have Jesus without having Mormonism. And a lot of people didn't really understand yeah. that. One thing, we, we've been talking so quickly, and this is a wonderful talk. Yeah. I just recognize that as I try to explain something, I jump on, you know, I jump onto another car in the train and I forget, I jump <laughs> over some cars. But one of the things that you asked about earlier was during that process about states of grace. So after my experience um, in prayer, and I was wandering around not knowing what to do, but I had to still, that's when I decided to make the film States of Grace. And mm -hmm. because I realized, I knew that my time as a Mormon was limited because I knew that However, this all came together, I couldn't remain a Latter-day Saint and not believe. And so eventually I would have to come out and be public about it. Um, but uh, and before I was ready to do that, it was like, well, I, I want to make one last film for this for this Latter-day Saint, for Mormon cinema, for the Latter-day Saint audience. And that's where the film States of Grace came from, which was a follow up to uh, to God's Army. So that was God's and Army. Show, show States of Grace, Jill. And then States of Grace was uh, originally released as God's Army 2. Yeah. Uh, but what I didn't realize was, was while I had been absent trying to make the Joseph Smith film, um, all these other people had jumped into the marketplace and just completely, basically destroyed the market because uh, all these bad films. And, and then even at that point, Mormons were like, well, why am I going to pay regular movie prices to go see one of these movies when I could see Lord of the Rings or something yeah. like that? And so by the time I, I, I wasn't really aware of that. So when I came out with States of Grace, God's Army 2, States of Grace, I didn't realize, but everybody was just associating my films with their films and that they're all the same. And, and uh, 
So after that, I just ripped off the God's Army too and let it stand on its own. Okay, okay. That's why it's got that title. Well, it's very but, clear in States of Grace that you were understanding the forgiveness of Christ and and maybe in some way still clinging to Christ, even though the rest of your faith was falling away. Yeah, yeah. And there were things that I just felt like... Uh, I knew that it was my kind of my farewell to the to the audience, mm -hmm. and there were things. And again, a great affection. Even you know, I had a great affection for the audience and for the people. And there were things I feel felt like I needed to say. You know, one of the things I felt like I needed. One of the things that had always bothered me was the 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 uh, the cross in Mormonism, um, and and it's changed a little bit. I like to think that I had something to do with that because <laughs> this was back in two thousand five, and I really you know, introduced the cross in a way that, uh, very prominently in this film because it had always bothered me the way some Mormons reacted to the cross as if they were Count Dracula, you know, just like, <laughs> and and I never got that. And uh, so I wanted to, you know, introduce that. And then the what you mentioned earlier about that, that famous quote from one of the LDS apostles who said, I'd rather have, I think it was Marion Romney, Marion G. Romney, I, I can't forget it, I can't remember exactly, but wow. who said, his father told him as he was going on his mission at the train station, I'd rather have you come home in a coffin than come home dishonored. Wow. And, yeah. um, and I, to me, that was, in my missionary days, that was, everybody knew that Everybody quote. knew that, that mm -hmm. little rule. Right. Yeah. And that, and to me, that was such a spit in the face to the atonement. And uh, I mean, I hate to use it in that, strong of language but it really is you know yeah, it's like well, yeah. so what are you saying it's like so certain sin, it's better to you know that, that jesus can't pay for certain sins and that's basically what it says yeah <laughs> and i really wanted to put that in there and illustrate it and so that's where and, and at that time you were your journey your own private stuff was not public per se right i mean god's army uh one was extremely well received and, and very successful and then states of grace i may i believe the executive producer was larry miller and right. and so you had still that lds support <laughs> and that encouragement yeah and i don't know if they get to see the script before or not but whatever they embraced they embraced it <laughs> and this is what you gave them and I'm telling you, if you have not seen God's Army One and, and and States of Grace as a as a you know as a two part sequel, it's a fascinating story, and it won't be just relevant to uh, LDS people or people that are interested in Mormonism. It's truly a human story of struggle and and curiosity and and failure and 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 forgiveness and uh, uh, you know the 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 powerful nature of God's grace to redeem and restore broken people. I think. Yeah, there's. Just, I almost want to. We'll do another show on states of grace. Yeah, it was I feel like so we could, awesome. We could just keep going on forever, but I yeah. do want to get back to what's the name of your your, your next movie? Everybody in suspense. What was that? And, Thirty minutes uh, ago. And where are you at? And and how are you gonna do it? When's this movie coming out? Yeah. Oh boy. Let me, yeah. Okay. Let's start with. Okay. Here. This is a uh, a. Um, we call it a mock poster. It's just kind of a, it's not necessarily the, the final poster. It's just the concept uh, in helping me to communicate what the film's about. Yeah. So uh, which camera should I point it at? Right that over there. One. All right. So um, we're calling it uh, Jesus is Enough. And uh, here it says, you know, the, the true story of a Mormon missionary's journey to Christ. Um, and that, I think, gives you a really, you know, an immediate visual idea of uh, what yeah. the film's yeah. about. And... So, uh, quick, you know, as I was finishing the script and was super excited about it and uh, just about feeling like, okay, now let's go out and get the, raise the money to make the film right as I, I just had taken a meeting or two and then COVID hit. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. And it, um, so that turned out to be a great blessing because I was able to spend, you know, I, I couldn't be out raising money, so I just kept working on the script, and and it, it turned out to be a great blessing. You know that instead of uh, it wouldn't have been a good thing if I'd just been able to raise the money and shoot the film. This gave me more time to make the film sharper, deeper, better, and uh, and so now that you know things are calmed down, now I'm you know out and have begun the process of raising the funds to make. Jesus is enough. So where should people go if they're interested in in being a part <laughs> but, of it? But this is not unlike. A lot of, I mean, I just think sometimes people think, well, that means it's a, a cheap movie or something. Oh. Independent filmmaking 
is a, is an industry. You've done it with all your previous movies. Other people are doing it. So the fact that people do invest and, and get excited about a film is pretty standard, isn't it? It is. Uh, it's a long process, and uh, it's uh, independent filmmaking is difficult. And it's extremely important that I make this independently and distribute it independently. That's something that I've learned over making eight films and, and distributing, or sometimes, you know, bringing other companies on to distribute for me. And I've learned. A lot of lessons, um, mm. but one thing I've learned is uh, uh, I've always known that I had to be independent in the kind of films that I want to make because if I were to make this film with some studio, Lionsgate or somebody, you know, they'd be in there saying, oh, you got to tone down this message. You know, you got to, you don't want to offend, you don't want to offend this audience and you want to make sure that the, you know, the LGBTQ audience is happy with this and there's nothing that would offend. But you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah, They're going to be yeah, like, yeah. you know, and you got to make sure that, you know, every race is represented and you got to make sure that my girlfriend has a part and you've got to, mm -hmm. and it would just be, <laughs> you know, ridiculous. So, uh, having the complete freedom to tell the story that, that Micah and I want to tell and th that we're going to tell and to be able to cast the actors that we want that are, that are going to do the best job, not the actors that because the marketplace, you know, right now, you know, wants certain people in it. And, uh, and then to be able to distribute it, you know, the way that, that we want to distribute it, to, to be able to market it the way that we want to market it. If we were making this movie with any other company, they would probably say, you can't use that title. You can't yeah. use Jesus is enough. That's too Christian. That's too, that's going to put people off. And it's like, well, th that's what the, that's what it is. And that's what we're doing. So, um, yes. And then to make the movie right, um, it's expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Filmmaking is incredibly expensive. Yeah. It's a, um, and to do it, to do it right. And this is a big story. It's uh, the way that it's written and told it, it cover, you know, I mean, it happens. Most of it happens in the 2005, 2006, well, 2005, 2004. And, and as strange as it is, as it is to say that, that makes it a, a period piece, which mm -hmm. means, you know, wardrobe, certain car, automobiles are certain. I mean, everything is is mm, uh, that. And then there are so many characters in this film. Uh, it's really a it, it sounds like a, a really small movie. Mm -hmm. And there are parts of it that are uh, that are powerfully intimate. Um, but it's a big story. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and, and, and what follows uh, from Micah's story has continued to ripple through his family right? Uh, mm -hmm. and through what his family, I mean, it's no secret. His, his mom was a teacher at BYU and eventually she herself wrote a book States. Uh, is that States of Grace? Unveiling I'm, I'm Grace. Sorry. Unveiling Grace. That's the movie is States of Grace. But Lynn Wilder told, tells her story of discovering grace and leaving BYU and how tumultuous that was for her and her husband, Michael. So there, there really has been a rippling of a rippling of a rippling. And you know what is fascinating? And, and we're going to give you, we're going to wrap this up, Jill, I promise. Uh, you know, I, I do say this to a lot of my LDS friends. You know, when I was a kid in the LDS church, it was like, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that left the church and they were, they were a Satanist, you know, they were the worst of the worst. They were an adulterer, <laughs> a murderer. And because we couldn't even conceive of anybody leaving it, it this is the one true church upon the face of the earth and you know only the worst of the worst get deceived well today in 2023 uh, many of my LDS friends know somebody not not four places removed but it's their brother their friend oh, everybody knows uh, you know a mom a dad uh we've met a young man who was a super zealot young missionary uh with a, with his companion and his companion you know struggled and began to doubt and began to question and read and he informs him that, you know, I'm leaving the LDS faith. And he says, no, you can't. And so he jumps into the pool, reading all the same materials to, to redeem his friend, to help his friend come back. And now he's said, I, I, I you know, yeah. I get it. You yeah. know, um, Craig Blomberg, the author of How Wide the Divide, uh, just sent me an email of a young man. Uh, I won't identify him, but he, he was kind of known as a, <clears throat> an LDS apologist and a devotee of Stephen Robinson. And uh, he, he said, after, I want you to know, after all these years, um, the theology of biblical Christianity has transformed me and, and I am no longer a Latter-day Saint. And it was shocking to hear that. So again, this has to be dealt with. This, yeah. this is the right time for a, 
<clears throat> a movie like this. Right. And again, Mike is one of the things that drew me to the way that he tells his story and the way that he handles his ministry is it's just very gentle. He's not, he's not attacking the mm. LDS church. He's telling his story. Right. Right. And, um, and he's sharing his testimony. And, um, and I felt like that's very important in the, the way that the film is, as I approach it is, um, this is not, we're not attacking the LDS church. Um, this is just, his story. Yeah, yeah. And again, I have such affection for these characters. Most of the characters in the film are LDS. And so I love being, you know, they're my family. They're my, yeah. they're my friends. They're my <clears> people. So, so, uh, and I know them and, and, um, I can't imagine if somebody who wasn't LDS tried to tell this story, you'd get something like, you know, the under the banner of heaven or whatever, where you just, they're <laughs> off, you know, it's just, they don't yeah. understand yeah, the words yeah. that, you know, the, the vocabulary, the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we are, the way that we believe. So anyway, uh, yes, the important thing is now that I'm, um, in the fundraising phase, man, I need, we've, you know, the script is ready. The only thing holding the film back is money. I I'd be shooting this film, I'd tomorrow I'd start shooting the film if I had the funds. Do you but, have a cast and everything at this? No, point? no, no. Oh, okay. I, I'm not casting until I. Uh, we we can't nail down the dates that we're yeah, filming yeah. because we don't know. It all depends on on the money. So I'm hoping to be able to shoot this autumn. That's what I really really want to do. But um, it it all depends on money. So now um, I'm reaching out to anybody, and you know people think, and there's a way for anybody if they want to donate twenty dollars to, you know a million dollars, we have a way for people to do that. Um, a lot of people, what, what a lot of people don't realize though, is that, uh, you know, when I talk to people sometimes, you know, they don't have $50,000 to put into a movie, but, but, but if they think about it, they're like, Oh, wait a minute. I know this one guy. And I know, you know, this one guy, he's, he might be interested and he's got some money. Those are the kind of ways that I, when I raise money, it's knocking on doors, talking to people, having conversations and just letting people know what I'm doing. And who do you know that might be interested in, in investing, lending, donating, donate, donating money, you know, and, and so the way that I've set it up is, uh, we have a, um, a, uh, our, we've set it up so that, it, you know, a, a way to invest so that people can buy units if they have $25,000, $50,000 more, they can buy units in the film. And uh, this is all very, you know, uh, done, everything done according to the rules and regulations of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So we're, we have a way for people to do that. If people don't have a larger amount of money to donate, to invest in the film and to own a piece of the film, they could lend money to us. That's one of the things about the, the, the investment um, structure is and we're raising a total of $10 million, $5 million to make the film, $5 million to market and release and distribute the film, um, which sounds like a lot of money, $10 million. And it is a lot of money. But most of the major movies, $100 million, you know, right. I mean, this, the, yeah. Right. And we are, this will be a theatrically released. It's going to go uh, nationwide, hopefully internationally. Um, and uh, so... Uh, and I've broken everything down in our business plan to show how that, you know, how everything works, where all the money comes from, where it goes. And it, it's all very, I've got one of the best business plans, I think, out there, movies or otherwise. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I spent a lot of time on it during COVID. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so people, one of the things about that structure is until I raise $3 million, I can't spend any of that money that uh, when people buy units when they, when they're investors in the film. So in order to, but right now I've got to travel, I've got to meet, I've got to come up with materials. I've got, you know, so many expenses, um, to keep this process going. So right now it's very important that I just have, um, that the film has income to keep it going. And one of the ways that people can't invest is to loan money. They can loan. And then when we hit that $3 million threshold, those people get, um, uh, get that money paid back plus whatever interest we agree upon. And that's really helpful. And it's really a wonderful way because people can actually basically make money off their loan investment in the movie before I even start shooting the film. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a cool little yeah. mechanism. In and there. with the guarantee that, you know, you're not going to, they're not going to lose their money. Right. I mean, you're betting on all you're betting on is that I'm actually going to be able to raise at least $3 million to, to make this, and I'm not stopping. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, this yeah. is this is what I'm doing. I'll, yeah, for the rest of my life, if it takes, I'm not. You know, I'm going to keep <laughs> going until this movie is made. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And then, of course, and if somebody doesn't even have enough money to really loan like a significant, whether it's five thousand, ten thousand, or whatever, if somebody just has a hundred dollars that they're they're like, hey, I want to, I, I think this is great, and I want to support it, uh, you can go to adamsroadministry.com which is Micah Wilder's uh, and the Adams Road Music Ministry you can go to their site adamsroadministry.com and there's a, a way to donate to the ministry on that site and if you donate and you on the little section where they give you that you can make a note if you just say this is for the movie hmm. or for the movie then at the ministry they know that this is uh, earmarked specifically for the movie and they will um Great. They will pass it on yeah. to that. Um, so those and those we'll, ways. We'll list that at the bottom the, of the YouTube yeah, page. Yeah, and then what is the website to find out more about investing? Uh, Edgewater. Well, right now the way that uh, you have to be very careful when you're when you're selling investments about what you do publicly, especially okay. online. There are a lot of rules and regulations okay. with the. Um, the how can they get in touch with you? So they can get in touch with me by <laughs> she's, she's emailing trying to help me. at this point. <laughs> uh, this is a very direct way of doing it. Yes. But if you go Richard at edgewaterfilm.com, okay. email go. me and say, hey, I, uh, I, you know, I'm interested in investing or loaning. Uh, or I, uh, and it, by the way, if you donate, uh, if it's $100 and you do that, uh, I would love to hear from you, you know. So please, if you if you donate, if you go onto the AdamsRoadMinistry.com yeah. and donate $100 or $20 or whatever and shoot me uh, a little email, Richard at EdgewaterFilm.com. Okay. Uh, I would love to hear that and to feel that support uh, because right now it's me every day. I just get up, I call, I, I, I drive, I knock on doors, I meet with people, and uh, I love to... Uh, just like an old missionary. You're just like an old missionary or an old uh, vacuum salesman. I'm just knocking on doors all the time. Um, and then the, another way that's that's helpful is uh, if you go to uh, if you go to richardducher.com, you can find these. You know, you can you can order these movies, and uh, if you're into you know physical media, you can do that. That helps out. And if you go, or even in a really roundabout way, if you go on Amazon.com and and rent any of these movies eventually you know a few months down the line you know we'll get i'm basically something any, comes your way this is my entire yeah. life right yeah. now so yeah. whatever money i get whether it's from old movies or whatever it all goes into jesus is enough because yeah. um this is my this is my life and this is my mission now is to make this movie yeah yeah it, it's an amazing um amazing quest an amazing journey that you're on let me say one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This and it's also my <coughs> ministry. You know, I, one of the things I love that uh, that I one of the things I loved about <clears throat> the Christian world as opposed to the the LDS world was when I started attending different churches, and I attend a lot of churches now. I just you know I, I love going to all kinds of you know all different congregations and meeting new people and new pastors. But one of the things that that struck me as so wonderful was. Um, and that I didn't grow up with in Mormonism was you'd meet somebody and, you know, just somebody gets the Lord puts it on their heart to serve a mission of one kind, start a ministry of some kind, a music ministry or or to go and be a missionary somewhere or to help the homeless or whatever. Yeah. And people, you know, that's their calling and they run out and they do it. You know, they just they and there's all these people that uh, don't wait mm for the church to call them on missions or, the, you know, they, and they don't wait, you know, they don't just give their money to the church mm -hmm. and let the church do the stuff, but they actually are out there in the world, you know, acting on their, out of their own dictates Burdens of their own their hearts. Passions. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and for me, I'm really proud to be able to say that this is my ministry. You mm -hmm. know, this is, the yeah. Lord has put this on my heart yeah. to do it. and it's a ministry yeah. because, you know, because ultimately, you know, <clears throat> ultimately I'm trying to point people to Jesus. I'm trying yeah. to point people, you know, to where I, you know, I'm trying to talk to the, to this audience and to me in 2004 and to basically anybody. I mean, to me to think, you know, that somebody might, this film might be playing in New York city. Most of my films have played in New York city and that some guy might just wander in off the street mm -hmm. who needs this yeah, you know, and, yeah. who, and who's going to see this. And, and the scenes mm. in this movie, uh, there are going to be so many opportunities for people to, if their hearts are at all open to yeah, uh, yeah. to an experience or a conversation with God, this movie is going to open their hearts. And, uh, and you that's know, what I, it's all about. I think it's fascinating uh, with the advent, certainly, of Dallas Jenkins' work with The Chosen. 
and the whole model of crowdsourcing, uh, the advantage you have today is over the last three, four or five years, this model has been seen by a lot of people that you can support at $20, $30, $50, $100 and, and believe in something because you want others to experience right. it and you're 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 not you don't have to be a heavy hitter or some big financier you can be a, a, just a person who so appreciates it that you want want somebody else to be able to watch it so well, the whole crowdsourcing exactly idea that's is exactly. totally relevant to what you're doing both the bigger gifts that could help you make you know a lot of progress on your financial planning but for the average person crowdsourcing and saying hey I can I can contribute something and and I'm just hopeful that this will happen and that this message will get out there. Yeah. Chosen is an excellent example because yeah. it's like, that is something that would not have happened. No way. No studio would ever have no. greenlit a project like that and supported it. And if they had, it wouldn't have been the, wouldn't have what been what he wanted it to be. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that's absolutely true. So it's only, I mean, real, it is really the $10 people, the $20 people, the $50 people that made that movie happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, right now for me in this, it's like, uh, yeah, we're not crowdsourcing per se right now, but through the ministry, you know, <clears throat> those those small donations, especially right now in the beginning when, you know, I haven't raised $3 million yet, so I don't, you know, these little amounts that help me keep going every day um, are so, so important. You know, and I would say $1,000 now is more important than a million dollars <laughs> six months from now. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we probably have come to the end of this great, story but that's it's, too bad i'm having fun it's so. <laughs> it's only the end of a chapter it's not the end of the the longer book you know um so jill i think that we've uh we've given people an opportunity to learn about not only richard dutcher and his filmmaking and states of grace and now this new project jesus is enough um i hope that that if you're curious enough about this future film that you'll go back and check out in particular God's army and then States of grace um, and the Brigham city film. Uh, you'll get a, an appreciation of Richard's talents and abilities as a director, as a writer, and even in God's army, an actor, you know, uh, you, you're a part, you, it's a younger version of you, but you're there and uh, you're there with all the zeal and passion of a, of a LDS missionary. Um, so we just are very grateful. And I, and I'm telling you, uh, if you watch States of Grace and can keep a dry eye at the last scene, um, and it's a multi-faith experience. There's a, a there's a Pentecostal minister there. There's a non-believer there. There's LDS missionaries there. There's Lutherans there, and they're all focused on one thing: this little baby Jesus in the nativity scene. And I'm telling you, I, the other night I've I've watched the film before, and I hadn't watched it in a while, so Jill and I watched it. And uh, I, I asked her, I said, are you crying? And she said, yes. And I said, me too. And I'm like, I, and I know how this story ends, you know, but it's still the emotional impact of somebody discovering God's love, God's mm -hmm. grace, mm -hmm. God's mercy, God's forgiveness, forgiveness yeah. God's gift. Um, so you, you did that very, very well, uh, m even more than I remember. And uh, it, it's a fabulous, fabulous movie. Um, it, well, stands, secret, it stands I, by itself. I I made the film, so I've seen it, what, 200, 300 times. I cut it. I edited it. I did. And uh, I still cry at the last scene. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> when you can make yourself cry, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. So, Jill, any final words? This has been amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Richard. We have loved getting to know you and hearing your story. And I can't wait for this film to come out. It's going to oh, be exciting. You. Yeah, thank thanks you. for More having to me come. On. Let's do this again sometime. This is <laughs> yeah. a lot of Yeah, things. for sure. So thanks for listening in to uh, Building Bridges with Greg and Jill. Again, like, subscribe, notification button, and comment. We try to respond to those comments. Again, even if you're not thrilled with the topic of this particular podcast or it's rubbed you wrong, and engage us. Talk with us about that. Give us feedback. Um, you know, Jill and I uh, had talked about these stories. We, we go in the most interesting places and... I was in the conference center earlier last year and, and some guy, a technician, was working in the conference center setting up for an event. And he said, hey, you're Greg Johnson. I said, yeah, do we know each other? He says, oh no, we've never met. And I said, well, how do you know me? He says, I listen to your podcast. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like, who knew? You know, it's that experience like somebody walking into New York and you don't have a clue who or when or what situation that's gonna be. And you, you go, wow, it's media takes things to people when they're interested in listening and watching and they can do it uh, today and they can do it next year they can do it for a long time so enjoy uh those two uh, uh those two uh, uh 
movies and maybe consider the next one. So, again, we'll see you next time. We always drop our our uh, podcast on the first Tuesday of the month. So we, uh, we're out here on Tuesday, the first Tuesday of February, and then we'll see you next time um, for another exciting episode. God bless. Have a great month. Thank you.